peace and blessings and welcome to the opening ceremonies of the American Folklore Society's 132nd annual meeting. I am Queen Noor and I am so glad I'm here and I am so glad you're here and I can see in the chat that you're glad you're here. So although we're in different spaces right now, I want you to say that with me together like because we really are in the same feeling, in the same space, even though we're virtual. So let's say it together. I'm so glad I'm here. Come on, y'all. I'm so, so glad, I'm, glad here. I'm here. Yeah, that's right. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. Let's say it together. I'm so I'm glad. So glad I'm you're. Here. Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. I, I'm so glad you're here. That's for that's sure. right. And I'm so glad I'm here, Chris. And we gather in this time to present with one another. Yeah, it's in a different way. Yes, but yet the same. For although there are screens and scenes and miles and mirrors between us, we gather to connect in purpose. Connecting beyond the binaries is a brave space. And you have come. What'd you say, Chris? Yes, you have come to the right place, everybody. Welcome. I'm so glad to be here and be with all of you. Great to be here with you, Queen. Thank you so much for uh, your great introduction, the great work you always do. Um, so that this year is gathering, like you said, it, it's definitely different, but it's an opportunity for us to connect in a different kind of way with each other. And I, I think we've all been through this 2020 journey. Um, and I think really what we need to do is be together in a way that it gives each other space um, to talk about where we've been on this journey, uh, where we are right now, where we hope to be. And I think that's uh, what's going to be different about this meeting, um, creating space not only intellectu intellectually, but I think spiritually and emotionally. I just hope that uh, it's a space where we can all connect on that too. It's super important um, that we're together. So. Yeah, and we're honored, Chris and I, we're honored to be your hosts for this evening's opening ceremonies. Uh, and we are coming to you live and real. Right. So perhaps there just might be some technical or other imperfections, but the perfect is in the honoring of one another, giving undaunted energy, sharing our professional connections, for foraging deep intellectual inquiry. Here is a quintessential listening space for critique and dialogue and a reunion of colleagues and friends. So we're, we're test driving this new platform and there's gonna be bumps, right? Uh, and this is a journey, but we understand as Queen has said, this is a, uh, a ride share and we'll be uh, talking not at each other, but with each other all the way. So that's, that's the goal of this. So if you have questions, you can drop them in the Q and A box. Um, we're in it together. We'll get through this, and uh, let's let's just uh, connect with each other and and um, learn from each other. So I think right now um, we're going to officially kick off the AFS um, virtual edition, and we welcome the illustrious president, Dr. Norma Cantu, to offer some opening remarks. Oh, thank you, Queen Noor and Chris. I don't think we've ever had an MC for our opening. I love it. I think it's wonderful. And yes, so glad to be here. I would like to begin by acknowledging the spirits of this place, the American Folklore Society, by acknowledging all my ancestors and asking permission from and honoring all who have come before us. Were it not for COVID-19, we would be in Tulsa or Tulsi in Muskogee. And no doubt on site, I would begin by acknowledging the indigenous nations and communities central to that place and who today call it home. When we, held, when we do hold our meeting in Tulsa in 2022, surely we will speak about the painful history that brought the Cherokee, the Muscogee, the Yuchi, Shawnee, and Osage, among others, to Tulsa and of course, other indigenous peoples as well. Our virtual format makes it difficult to honor an already complicated effort 
to center and foreground our relationships with obligations to indigenous individuals and communities. And as we begin our first virtual annual meeting of the American Folklore Society, I ask how far can this genre of land acknowledgement extend before it loses the social context and undergird its power? While these very questions are a matter of active debate among Native Americans and First Nations political leaders and intellectuals, I think we can learn about the wider stakes involved and I urge us all to listen. Part of the debate about territorial acknowledgments is that for some, the genre has become in the language of our day and in theoretical terms of interest to our field, especially merely performative. We know just how powerful cultural performance, including opening ceremonies such as this one, can be. But we are also sensitive to what this critique is getting at. Those who are trying to repair the territorial acknowledgement genre have made recommendations to this end, and all of them beyond our capacity, unfortunately especially as we face the reality that you are listening from hundreds of different locations around not just the United States, but colonized Americas and the wider world. Since our meeting in Long Beach, when we resolved to establish deep and serious relationships with local communities that host our gatherings, we have done so. And so we plan to do in Tulsa. Our plans are now deferred to 2022 when we gather there, ojalá. Of course, we will seek to do the same in Harrisburg next year, and I know the local committee there is already on it. As folklorists, we can heed indigenous calls to deepen our commitment to community-engaged scholarship and to avoid extractive research practices. As a special emphasis within broader AFS inclusion efforts, we commit to finding specific tangible ways of making AFS more open and welcoming to indigenous members and useful to indigenous communities in the US, in Canada and elsewhere. The board and I will share updates on such efforts in Harrisburg next year. This afternoon, I'm joining you from my beloved Yanawana, known as San Antonio, the land of the Papaya from the Coahuiltecan people my ancestors. I invite each of you to consider where you are sitting today, what you are doing to acknowledge the ancestors and descendants of that place. How do we ensure these acknowledgements are not passive expressions? Given our society's commitment to higher education and to community culture heritage work, we invite you to contribute your energy and passion to furthering the goals of AFS in this regard. I'll say a few more words about this in a bit, but I have a special treat today. I invited my friend, the Oklahoma poet laureate, Janetta Calhoun Mish, to read one of her poems. She chose her poem, Pia Toya. Thank you for inviting me to join you this evening. My first poem, the title is in Comanche, and I'm not a very good speaker of Comanche, so forgive me if you are. Biatoya, tell me your story, Shauna said. This is how we say hello in Comanche. You said yes, there is a story behind that story, and all night long over the clamoring slots, we speak story, honoring our histories, recognizing the web of words story weaves, spinning tales that bind us one tribe to another. Years ago, Oren told me all stories are true, whether they happened or not is another matter. Inside your heart is a mountain written over with a story not its own. Let us remember its ancient name, tell its true story in the old way, made new. Thank you, Janetta, for your words. What a beautiful poem. We are really looking forward to your participation along with our other invited presidential plenary speakers, Alison Hedge-Coke and Charlotte Heath, 
on Saturday afternoon, right before our closing reception. Be a nice bookend. It was a different world a year ago when we met in Baltimore. And as we began the meeting this year, I acknowledge this shift. And I must tell you, I am so very proud of us, of AFS as an organization, and so many of us who have done so much to face this new world, not just for ourselves, but for others. Those of us in public folklore have faced unimaginable challenges, both financial and logistical, but we have moved forward keeping our programming schedules when possible by hosting online concerts and exhibits, mobilizing our resources to help our collaborators, the artists we work with, fundraising to provide real financial assistance. And here I'm thinking of Ellen McHale at New York Folklore or Charlie Lockwood at Texas Folklife and so many others across the country. I want to thank all of you who generously supported such efforts. And those of us in academia, we have more or less successfully switched our teaching to online. We have learned words like synchronous and asynchronous and mastered Zoom meetings and Flipgrid and Google Meet and forged ahead, working with our graduate and undergraduate students as they too adapt and learn to navigate the stormy seas of this new world. A quick Shout out to my friend and former president, Kay Turner, for her project, Naming the Lost, a project born out of love in response to COVID. We're living proof that we do work that matters, that our work matters on so many levels. While we're not in Tulsa, we are together, like Quinn and Chris were saying, and we are so glad to be here. And as you will hear throughout the meetings and sessions and plenary talks and in workshops and at the Festival of Ideas, and what some of you have already heard in our section meetings that met prior to this meeting, we have worked hard to meet our goals, fulfill the objectives that we set for ourselves since Long Beach and in response to our member survey that established priorities for our society. It is a multifaceted endeavor as we organize within our sections and in committees like the cultural diversity, the media and public outreach, the international. All of these committees work hard for AFS. Thank you to all its members. The Journal of American Folklore, along with other leading journals in our field, are also moving forward, finding ways to respond to this call for change. I want to assure you that your board and many who lead sections and committees are eager to advance an ongoing and durable AFS agenda that is mindful not only of the colonial histories that shape the American in our name. By the way, I've always thought it was the hemispheric America myself, but I realize most people mean the United States and not the hemisphere. As I was saying, we were determined to pursue and remain responsive to the changes that we identified in our last membership survey and with many members of the communities we work, we work with, what they call for, the immigrant communities, the Native American and indigenous nations, in short, the countless intersectional communities, LGBTQ, our elders, cultural bearers, political leaders, activists, scholars, of course, folklorists of color, including indigenous folklorists. Mindful of our responsibilities to our field as scholars and practitioners, and because I believe we hold a key role in the transformation of our world, I know that this historic gathering will provide ample room and space for dialogue, for transformation, most of all, for growth. It has been a privilege and an honor to work with the incredible staff at AFS. We are so very fortunate to have a committed, diligent, hardworking team taking care of the business of the society. They go above and beyond. We have so much to look forward to, so much learning, listening, sharing to do this week, but everything has gone virtual. Even our ofrenda, that special place that offers a space for honoring those who have left us this past year, even that is online. And I invite everyone to visit that sacred space. 
I want to acknowledge the executive board that has worked with me so hard this year. Past President Dory Noyes from Ohio State University, Amanda Dargan from City Law, Luisa Del Guidici from LA, Thomas A. Dubois, University of Wisconsin-Madison, Michael Dillon Foster, Univers excuse me, University of California, Davis, Faria Khan, University of Pennsylvania, Ellen McHale, New York Folklore, Tom Mould, Butler University, Patricia Sawin, University of North Carolina, Deborah Lat Latanzi Shudika, George Mason University, Emily Sokolov, University of Texas at Austin, and of course, our Executive Director, Director Jessica A. Turner. All of these friends, and yes, they have become close friends after working so hard this year, uh, invite you to enjoy the program, to enjoy your time with us. Mil gracias, a thousand thank yous to all of you for your work out in the world. And thank you for your service to the society, for your participation in this iteration of our annual meeting. I give you a welcome. Bienvenidos, bienvenidas, bienvenides. Gracias. Wow. Well, we want to thank you and de nada, de nada, de nada, and gracias y tú, to you, Norma, uh, for your leadership and your gracious words, your eloquent words, and your grounding of us so that we know why we are here. And we're hearing why we are here. Now, in this place and time, putting together the annual meeting, well, normally, it's a sheer Roman task, right? It, it's a huge task in normal circumstances. But yet now, it's even more of a task. And the circumstances is always a big task. So you can imagine what it took to achieve it this year with the technical and cultural shifts that needed to be addressed. And so we want you to give a warm, loving, big, sharing welcome to our executive director. Here we go. And here she comes, Jessica Turner. Thank you, Queen Noor. I don't think I've ever gotten an introduction like that. <laughs> I appreciate it so much. Um, this has been a lot of work. We are worn out, but we're also so excited that everybody's here. But I think also about um, motherhood and childbirth and how you work so hard to get to something and, you know, it arrives and you realize, well, now we have to get through it. <laughs> and so I think that is the moment that we're in. We're really glad to bring this meeting to you. But now also, we will do our best to make sure it works the whole time that you're here with us this week. Um, and this is just one of many times that we are eager to bring conversations to you. Um, on behalf of the AFS staff, I just want to say that for every one of us serving as AFS staff, there's a team of volunteers and consultants holding us up right now. <laughs> and we appreciate all of you. And for every one of the Zoom sessions that you will experience during this meeting, imagine the number of meetings that it took to prepare each one of those conversations and presentations. Uh, there have been committee-sponsored special conversations that have been developing over months, uh, section events, section business meetings that have been happening over the last couple of months, panel sessions, panelists and chairs have all required different and often more work this year. This year reminds us that collaboration and continued learning doesn't happen just one week of the year, nor does the growth of our field. We have seen this during the past eight months when the pandemic shifted all of us into this virtual space, and we have worked together in stronger networks than ever. So in many ways, this meeting feels like a continuation of many critically important conversations that went virtual in March 
and were amplified this spring as we reckon with continued and systemic racial and social injustices. We have a lot to discuss this week, and we're really glad that we're here. We thank the AFS Executive Board and all the committees of AFS for service to the field. We especially thank the 2020 Local Committee, um, now dubbed the Not-So-Local Committee, for working tirelessly throughout the year during this pivot from meeting in Tulsa to meeting in our homes and offices around the world. We also thank the members of the 2020 Virtual Meeting Task Force uh, for consulting with us throughout the development of this meeting platform that we present to you today. Finally, we thank all of you for pulling up a chair and joining us. We appreciate our meeting sponsors and we encourage you to hop over to the exhibit gallery while you're here and learn more about our sponsors and connect with them. Additionally, we have a lot of partners and colleagues to thank those at the National Endowment for the Arts, Oklahoma Humanities, the Council for Libraries and Information Resources, the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, the American Folklife Center, Local Learning, National Council for Traditional Arts, the Oral History Association, Missouri Folk Arts, Vermont Folklife Center, the Greenwood Cultural Center, the Gilchrist Museum, and the Woody Guthrie Center. We thank you all. We also thank our members for your generosity during these very uncertain times. This year, we flexed our finances to hire additional part-time staff to lead us into this virtual meeting and to support the work that you all do. These brilliant people have made this meeting possible and they include our full staff members, Lorraine Cashman and Meredith McGriff, um, who deserve um, a huge, huge shout out for this meeting and also, several part-time staff members, including our graduate assistant, Ben Bridges, Alexandra Sanchez, Roz Rennie Larson, TJ Smith, Micah Ling, Gloria Colom, Katie Brown, Delara Inham, Emily Bianchi, Kenzie Brook, Adrian Pantacorvo, and Jesse Fivecoat. The generosity of our members, you and those of you who couldn't join us, allowed us to reduce registration fees for this meeting by offering the pay what you can option. We also granted dozens of registration fee scholarships so that we could make this meeting more accessible. AFS fellows, the Cultural Diversity Committee, and numerous sections shifted their award support by supporting memberships and registrations instead. Some of you even paid for your students membership and registration fees. We look forward to the coming days of sharing ideas and connecting with each other virtually as we continue to deepen our learning and our listening. Thanks for being part of this. Yeah. Thank you, Jessica. So much so so much we uh, appreciate you being here and we're going to continue with our programming and we want to do a little bit of housekeeping before we continue um we know that you have some might have some questions um and how do i use zoom leak how do i attend a panel what securities are in place and pay attention everyone because we're about to tell you we're going to get a little bit into some housekeeping and you'll hear um we already see that you know the etiquette you know that when we come together we greet each other we talk to one another we warm to one another we can see that all in the chat right and now we just want uh, to to critique you just a little bit more, just give you a little bit more information. We are all so familiar with permission forms and release forms. So you know that most of this will be recorded, right? So we're asking you, don't record. Don't take pictures, right? For if you got to follow that etiquette. And therefore, be aware, be aware that you're on video, act appropriate, Please do not record on your own or take any shots. Be kind. Be cool to one another. You might see somebody going off screen. They're where they need to, need to be. 
and you are where you need to be in the present. And in this present moment, Chris is going to take us into a special moment. Thanks, Queen. I, be kind and be cool. I, I like that. I, I, I will try to do that in my normal life. Uh, mm -hmm. It's hard to do right now because um, so much is going on. Um, and a, a necessary part of the opening ceremonies at AFS uh, includes remembering people we've lost. So it's been a tough year for all of us. Uh, and I think we've all uh, been connected to somebody that we've lost right now. I mean, how about you, Queen? How, how was uh, this, uh, the pandemic for you and, and uh, any, um, uh, how was it for you? Yeah, it has me closed down. I have had uh, family members who have been hospitalized. And yet, the other day I heard a story about a sister storyteller down in Atlanta who in March, they had a family gathering in February. In March, nine people got ill and five of them passed away. Oh, my God. You know, made transition. So we know that, you know, it's important for the, that, that the people that are making transition, they're in our hearts. They're in yeah. our minds, right? Yeah, and I think we all share that. That's what's so uh, tough about this year. And, and as I said earlier, I hope it's a, a chance for all of us to ask each other how, we, how we're doing and, and have we, uh, how has this experience been? I know for me in Brooklyn, I've lost uh, several um, community leaders that I've worked a long time with and uh, my predecessor, Kay Turner, worked with. And um, it's just been a, a hard thing to not be able to mourn and not be able to be together. As someone that does programming, the first thing I want to do is, is uh, you know, just be with people and figure out different ways we can celebrate them. And I, I, I dream about all these things I wish I could do. And, and that's the hardest part. So hopefully um, that this sort of mourning memorial kind of feeling uh, interweaves into all of our conversations in some way. So um, uh, for today, um, uh, we have two tributes this afternoon for long-term AFS members. Um, reading a tribute to I Isaac Levy, the convener of the Jewish section of, of AFS, Simon Bronner, and uh, also reading a tribute to Frank DeCaro will be read by Marsha Gooday, president of AFS Fellows. So um, we're going we're gonna to bring that up. Isaac Jack Levy of Blessed Memory, renowned for his studies of Sephardic Jewish folklore and history, passed away on January 22nd, 2020, shortly after his 91st birthday. Isaac Jack Levy was born to a Sephardic Ladino speaking Jewish family on the Isle of Rhodes in Greece on December 21st, 1928, among the most renowned Sephardic communities in the world. At the outbreak of war, his family left the Italian occupation of Rhodes in 1939 and went to the international city of Tangiers, Morocco, where he lived with a few other families from Rhodes who escaped German deportation. The United States through New Orleans in 1945. They made their home in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Brooklyn, New York. Isaac pursued advanced degrees at writing about his people, the Sephardim, and Ladino language and lore. Shortly after receiving his MA, he taught Spanish and Hispanic culture at the University of South Carolina and was also a visiting professor at Purdue University in 1961 and Texas Tech University in 1963. Among his awards are the Founders Award from the American Society for Sephardic Studies, the Quixote Award from the American Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese. He is the author of Jewish Roads, A Lost Culture, published in 1989, and Ritual Medical Lore of Sephardic Women, Sweeting the Spirits, Healing the Sick, published by the University of Illinois Press in 2002. With his partner in life, as well as in scholarship, Rosemary Levy Sumol. He is the translator and commentator of And the World Stood Silent, Sephardic Poetry of the Holocaust, also published by Illinois in 2000. Most recently, he contributed to Contexts of Folklore, which I edited with Wolfgang Meter. And 
even struggling then with illness, he was determined to get word out on the rich legacy of lore, the Sephardi. He published articles with Rosemary Zumwalt in the Journal of American Folklore on fieldwork among the Sephardim in 2001 and Sephardic proverbs and what goes around comes around, the circulation of proverbs in contemporary life, among many other book chapters and journal articles. He was a regular at American Folklore Society meetings and contributed greatly to the Jewish Folklore and Ethnology section of the American Folklore Society. I look forward to seeing him every year and admired his generosity, his intellect, and the creativity of a poet as well as a scholar. His words and spirit still live in the posthumous publication of the Sephardim and the Holocaust, A Forgotten People, completed by Rosemary Levy Zumwalt, which will be released by the University of Alabama Press on this day, October 13th. The lore of honoring the deceased in Jewish tradition is to give him blessings of peace. Alav hashalom. Adonai hu nachalatav tanu ach b'shalom al mishkava. Folklore should know that this last line of the mourner's prayer translates to the everlasting is his heritage, and he shall rest peacefully at his lying place. And let us say, Amen. Amen. Uh, Marsha is not able to be here, and so I'm going to be reading Frank de Caro. Frank de Caro died on March 22nd, 2020, in New Orleans, Louisiana. He was a distinguished and dedicated folklorist who had been member of AFS for 59 years. He and his wife, folklorist Rosanne Jordan, always participated in AFS meetings until two years ago. They met at Indiana University, where both earned their PhDs. The state of Louisiana was blessed when they decided to come to LSU in 1970. Frank published 14 books, three with Rosanne, with whom he frequently collaborated. Frank's publications included scholarship on proverbs, riddles, folk tales, legends, myths, and personal narratives, as well as folklore theory, women in folklore, and the history of folkloristics. His wide-ranging scholarship reflects his ability to study, absorb, and theorize about the cultures and places he came to know, including India, Mexico, Indiana, New York, and Louisiana, of course. What an immense contribution he made to the study and understanding of Louisiana folklore and folk life. Though he published widely on New Orleans and his obsession with parades, he also studied and participated in the Cajun country Mardi Gras. Barry Ansel had said this about the great photo he took of Frank at the Tibamo Mardi Gras. I think it captures the side of Frank that one could overlook if one was considering his elegant scholarship and demeanor. He had a playful side that could be downright quirky, and he also didn't mind finding himself on his butt for the sake of tradition. Frank's publications on Mardi Gras are brilliant analysis of carnival celebrations and performances, including the complexities of class, ethnicity, and race. He was also amused by some of the traditions and seeming absurdities of New Orleans Carnival, such as being invited to a ball, but not being allowed to dance. While Frank will be remembered for his scholarship, we will also remember his kindness, generosity, humor, and grace, evident from the outpouring of love and respect from his friends and colleagues. I will end, this is Marcia writing this, with two brief tributes from the many, um, from the many I loved on the fellows listserv. Gary Allen Fine said, he was a big man in so many ways. If there are parades in heaven, Frank will recount them and will inspire them. And from Jeannie Thomas, I'm glad Frank left us with so many wonderful books so we can still see the world through his perspective and kind eyes. I hope Frank is now joyously second lining somewhere. 
<laughs> and I have to tell you, he was the first I heard who had died of COVID early on. And it pained me deeply. I am still grieving. I had promised him and Rosan that when their time came, I would do this ceremony that is typical in my tradition. So I am going to say Frank's name three times, and I will ask that you join me in saying presente to attest to his presence in our lives. Frank Decaro, presente. Frank Decaro, presente. Frank Decaro, presente. Yes, presente. For those AFS members in our hearts, recognized and loved, named and unnamed, and for those lost to COVID in our hearts, recognized and loved, named and unnamed. Yes. What a year. 2020 will go down in history for a number of reasons, but chief among them will be loss. Hardly the perfect vision, 2020. That, that those numbers signify. Instead, it is the year of catastrophic loss, of gaping holes in our hearts and in our world. The magnitude of the loss in a global scale is certain to overwhelm and devastate. Every single life we have lost has left the vacuum. Remembering that no matter what the unimaginable number of deaths is today or tomorrow or the next day, that vague number becomes a single digit for many amongst us, a very real and singular number, an irreplaceable person. For those of us who have lost loved ones, mourning is an ongoing personal experience. Here, now, we choose to make it a collective one because what affects one of us affects us all. I ask you to consider the losses in the lives of our own folklore family. I want to remember my friend and staunch supporter of AFS, David Bozeman, life partner of executive board member Olivia Cadaval, and so many other loved ones we have lost this year. I know many of us are grieving. We invite you to add names, photos, memories to the ofrenda, the online memorial altar during our meeting. It is one of my favorite spaces at the annual conference where I go and say a quiet prayer for those who have left, who have transitioned. This time we will be doing it online. 2020 is also a year of reckoning for the ongoing tragedy of the murder of people of color. In our country, the violence against brown and black bodies continues, and we must say their names. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Vanessa Guillen, Freddy Benigno de la Cruz, Nicolas Chavez, Justin Howell, Sean Monterosa, James Floyd, and so many more names. As Marilyn White often reminds me, who is remembered lives. Let us remember them. For all those in our communities, in our hearts, recognized and loved, those named here in this space, and those unnamed. For all those who have made transition into the ancestral realm in this year, we offer the ofrende in a moment of silence.
What a tribute hmm. for those we, who remember. Yeah. We celebrate and we will continue to celebrate in our homes and even in this gathering space, those that we have lost and we honor them. But just as well as we are here at AFS, we celebrate living legacies. And we do, but before we go there, we have one last tribute. Mm -hmm. I introduce to you our colleague, my friend, Dr. Todd Lawrence. Hi everyone, my name is Todd Lawrence and I'm joining you from the Twin Cities in Minnesota, a community that's still trying to make sense of a difficult and traumatic summer. While our city still suffers, healing has begun. And art in the streets has played a significant role in that process, reflecting everything we've been through as a community. The images you're about to see are from the George Floyd and anti-racist street art database. This past summer, when our town erupted with pain, despair, and anger in the wake of the killing of George Floyd, the research team I'm a part of, the Urban Art Mapping Project, began what would grow into a community effort to digitally preserve art in the streets that was and still is an essential part of the movement for racial and social justice that started here on May 25th. Our team believes that walls speak and the walls of our community and many other communities across this nation have been screaming out in response to the pain we all felt when we saw a man's life snuffed before our eyes, when we heard of a young man shot while jogging or a young woman killed while lying in her bed. Let us take a moment to remember these three and all the other black lives we've lost as a result of senseless police violence. Let us commit ourselves both individually and as an organization to listen, imagine, and work towards building a world in which BIPOC folks, ourselves, our friends, our family, our neighbors, our colleagues, our fellow citizens will not be seen as a threat, will not have their lives discarded, will not be ignored and erased, but instead will be able to live without fear in peace, justice, and love. Thank you.
through the visual, through the folk art, through the traditions, through our heart, through our silence, we remember and we honor. And we thank Todd for producing that piece that's a legacy to memories. We honor again and we celebrate all of those we have lost through the injustice and the injustice of COVID, police violence, all those that we've lost who are so endeared to us. And in this space, in this time, we celebrate them. We celebrate them. And we're going to celebrate the living as well and the legacies that they are leaving with the AFS Awards. Thank you so much, Queen. Um, that was beautiful and, and such important um, work from Professor Todd Lawrence and beautiful words by Norma. Thank you guys so much. Um, so we want to thank all the section conveners for doing all the hard work to hold section business meetings in advance of the general meeting. We hope uh, those have been useful. Um, many section give, gives prizes for papers, books, contributions to spur greater involvement with the section and with AFS. So uh, we're gonna go through the section prize winners at a speed that hopefully pays respect to the work of the winners and doesn't turn this thing into a high school uh, graduation list of names. This is going really well though, right, Queen? I mean, I think uh, so. this, is pretty, this is pretty, pretty special. Mm -hmm. I, I, no glitches here. I mean, we're running <laughs> smooth, right? We have to just celebrate that. And it, we, we should celebrate the smoothness. Everyone. Don't uh, jinx it. Celebrate. Don't I'm jinx. sorry, I'm jinxing it. Okay. <laughs> you're right. You're right. So these are the awards and recognitions for the AFS 2020 virtual annual meeting. Um, the Children's Folklore Section of the W.W. Newell Prize to uh, Finan McGowan for an intriguing and noteworthy critique of sectarian divides in the children's folk game, Roman Soldiers. The next award, uh, they also awarded the Iona and Peter Opie Prize to Brandon Barker and Claiborne Rice for the book, Folk Illusions, Children, Folklore, and Sciences of Perception, an innovative study of the genre of folk illusions. Their cross-disciplinary approach places folklore studies in fruitful conversation with neuroscience, cognitive science, and psychology. The folklore and science section is happy to award the inaugural prize for folklore and science to Tim Frandy, whose paper complicates widely held assumptions that conservation and ecotourism are self-evidently morally righteous and ecologically helpful. The Foodways section announces the Sue Samuelson Award for Foodways Scholarship to Emma Kapustis for the paper, This Is Our Wine, We're Going to Drink It exploring the Newfoundland ter uh, terroir through berry wines. The History of Folklore section have awarded the Wayland Hand Prize to Guy Boehner for his book, Forgetful Remembers Remembrance, Social Forgetting and Vernacular Historiography of a Rebellion in Ulster, focusing on the Republican Rebellion in 1798. Boehner's book has profound general implications for the way that scholars analyze social memory, and an honorable mention was given to Daniel Swan and Jim Cooley for their book, Wedding Clothes and the Osage Community, A Giving Heritage. Mm-hmm. The independent, the independent section and the public section programs, um, they, uh, give two awards to outstanding independent folklorists working in the public sector. These winners are Nicole McCostis and TJ Smith. Nicole's work focuses on, focuses on Arab and Arab American community artists in Brooklyn, New York. And TJ works on issues of Appalachian heritage, foodways and folk arts education in North Georgia. 
The Nordic Baltic section has awarded the Barbro Klein Prize in the Nordic and Baltic folklore to Amber Rose Cedarstrom for her essay, Men and Milk Witches on Gatland, a folkloristic perspective on an art historical motif. The Transnational Asia Pacific section announces the Sabue Icon Award. Wei Liu, a PhD student in the Department of East Asian Languages and Literature at the Ohio State University. She is presently researching vernacular Confucian rituals and religious practices in Huzhou culture in Eastern China. The women's section announces that the Polly Stewart student travel stipend has been awarded to Elena Emma Sotolati. The committee was particularly excited about her work to recenter women's voices in Italian and Irish folk tales, scholarship by foregrounding neglected women folklorist, emphasizing feminist approaches to folklore, and studies and gender issues in the field. Now, let's turn to our Shiro, Jessica Turner, to facilitate the awards and prizes given by the board and the fellows. Thank you, Queen. We're gonna continue our awards presentation next with a recognition of new fellows of the American Folklore Society. Here to present the new fellows is Amy Schumann of the AFS Fellows, speaking on behalf of President Marsha Godet. Jessica, you need to um, allow me to use video if you want me to, otherwise I can just read. But it's um, saying that it requires the host to allow my video. One of our hosts can certainly do that. Thank you for being here um, in place of Marsha today, Amy. So, um, I don't know if anyone can see me now, but Marsha had planned to be with us, but the uh, hurricane knocked out her internet, and that's why Marsha is not with us. And she, um, so on behalf of Marsha, who is the president of the fellows, I want to announce the new fellows elected to the AFS fellows and international fellows. First, Pauline Greenhill who is a professor of women's and gender studies at the University of Winnipeg in Canada. Her book, Reality, Magic, and Other Lies, Fairy Tale Film Truths, is out later this year from Wayne State University Press. Her nominators described her as a, quote, rare dynamite scholar and a generous mentor of junior scholars, an innovative teacher, and a splendid example of feminist brilliance and integrity. Vladimir Hafstein is among the most important and original heritage scholars in the world. His research and publications about heritage theory and policy are grounded in extensive experience as an empirically rigorous scholar, as Iceland's UNESCO representative, and as a participant in intangible cultural heritage forms in many countries. Pravina Shukla opened New Directions in Folklore Research, conducting ethnographic folkloristic studies in India, Brazil, and Northern Europe, in which she identified as body art, including dress, adornment, and body decorations. She's a professor in the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology at Indiana University. And Zhuen Zhang, um, the, his nominators wrote, more than anyone else in the American Folklore Society, Zhuen Zhang, in his scholarship, service, and teaching, has actively built relations between folklorists in China and North America. He's the editor of the forthcoming special issue of the Journal of Folklore Research on the Folklore of Epidemics. Those are our um, fellows, newly elected fellows. And then we have um, our international fellows. First, on Deming who his research interests include popular religion among Han Chinese, Chinese proverbs and mythology, the intellectual history of Chinese folklore and study, and ongoing and tangible heritage safeguarding practices in both Chinese and global contexts. He's director of the folklore division in the Institute of Literature of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. 
Ursula Baumgart holds a university degree from the French National Institute of Oriental Languages and Civilizations, where she subsequently produced a very significant body of scholarly work and, and directed many theses and dissertations. The definitive textbook for her field is her book, Literature Orale Africaine, Perspectives Théoriques et Méthologiques, African Oral Literature's Theoretical and Methodological Perspectives. And finally, Sadna Natani is a professor at Jawaharlal Jawahal, Nehru University Center for German Studies, School of Language, Literature, and Culture Studies. She's the author of In Quest of Indian Folk Tales, uh, The Story Time of the British Empire, and several other books, and is well known as one of the most important folk narrative scholars. She's been a visiting scholar at several universities, and she served as president of the International Society for Folk Narrative Research. We have much longer profiles on each of these international and, um, and other and just regular fellows. And so we invite you to look at those on the website. Congratulations to the new international and fel other fellows. Thank you, Amy, um, for that announcement and for being here with us today. Now Norma will present the Chicago Folklore Prize. Uh, yes, so every year we present the Chicago Folklore Prize, which recognizes the best book length work, occasionally two works, a folklore scholarship for the year. Jointly offered by the Society and the University of Chicago, the prize is first awarded in 1928. Chicago Folklore Prize is the oldest international award of its kind for publishing in folklore. And this year, the prize committee presents the prize, the Chicago Folklore Prize, to two outstanding works. Simon Broner's The Practice of Folklore, and Essays Towards a Theory of Tradition, and Andrea Kita, The Kiss of Death, Contagion, Contamination, and Folklore. Broner's excellent book, The Practice of Folklore, based on the author's case studies, broadens issue-based discussions in folklore studies and beyond. A highlight is the essay, quote, The Shooter Has Asperger's, colon, Autism, Belief, and Wild Child Narratives. Examining and contextualizing key concepts of folklore in Europe and the United States, Simon proposes and systematically excuse me, systemically theorizes a paradigmatic shift in folkloristics toward a new definition of folklore in practice. This approach not only leads folklore studies out of the frame context of a particular folklore item and into cross-disciplinary approaches, but also connects the discipline mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the current mm -hmm. realities of digital communication and virtual groups in transmitting traditions and shaping individual and group identities. Andrea's book, uh, Kido's book, The Kiss of Death, Contagion, Contamination, and Folklore, is an outstanding study of vernacular discourse about contagion and contamination. It expands traditional folkloristic concepts of belief and health. Although the book is interdisciplinary in its approach, it places folklore at the center focusing closely on health, racism, hybridity, healing, rumor, and legend. Kito's analysis demonstrates how crucial it is to interrogate our biases and sources of information. Creatively unifying five case studies of folklore's role in the social construction of contested subjects related to health, she makes a strong case for the significance of folklore in advocacy related to public policy. The first case study, the disease is coming from inside the house, contagious disease, immigration, and patient zero, offers important insights into marginalization of people from certain cultural groups as dangerous others. The second case study, supernatural contagion, colon, slender man, suicide, violence, and slender sickness. Brilliantly interprets the slender man phenomena in relation to, outs to suicide clusters on Native American reservations. 
because of the insights this book provides in the midst of the current COVID-19 pandemic, Utah State University Press has made the book available to everyone as a PDF. Eloquently written and engaging, The Kiss of Death is both erudite and accessible to a wide leadership. Its organization and structure will inspire many students to explore or enter the world of folklore studies, and it is already helping scholars to navigate the complex landscape of the COVID-19 pandemic. Congratulations to both Simon and Andrea for this acknowledgement of your stellar contributions to our field. Each year, the American Folklore Society gives the Americo Paredes Prize for lifetime achievement in studying one's own community and encouraging others to do so. This year, the prize goes to Dr. Mario Montano of Colorado College in recognition of his relentless work to promote an appreciation of traditional cultures and mentor students in this work. Dr. Montano has contributed significantly to the understanding of the lives and cultures of Mexicanos living on both sides of the US-Mexico border. His service to AFS has centered these communities in which he works as an advocate and as a mentor. Trained as a cultural anthropologist and a folklorist, Dr. Montano's research focuses on the Texas-Mexico border and northern region of Mexico. His interests are on the anthropology of food. He tries to answer the following questions. How do food-centered activities influence the construction of cultural and gender identity? How do food preparation, distribution, and consumption contribute to men and women's social position and power? Drawing on his research, Dr. Montano's teaching focuses on Hispanic cultures living along the Rio Grande River, covering topics such as floodways, sociolinguistics, ethnographic methods, folk culture, and Mexican Americans. Dr. Montano works with his students closely, taking students in his course on an extended field research trip down the Rio Grande from the river's origin in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. It is important to note that Dr. Montano's contributions include his work as a mentor and a role model, not only at AFS, but with other professional associations at Colorado College and in his community. He gives generously of his time and expertise to students and colleagues alike. Congratulations to Dr. Montano for this award. Here is a brief video of AFS President Norma Cantu congratulating Mario on this prize. Hi, Mario. Uh, well, first of all, as president of the American Folklore Society, it is my great pleasure to just share with you and with everyone watching that you are the recipient of the Americo Paredes Prize this year. Thank um, you so much, Norma. That's a great honor. Really, I mean, and looking back at uh, the whole career and getting this award, it means a lot to me. Yeah, and and uh, Don Americo is such a figure. You know, when AFS started this award, we really wanted to honor people who do work in their own communities and with their own research, as he did. And it's been a, a wonderful roster of people who have done this kind of work that we have honored. And so I think it's very fitting that you have it. I don't think it would be out of place to say that Olga Nájera Ramírez nominated you. And it was a beautiful letter of nomination. And uh, the committee met and uh, decided that you would be the recipient. So make sure to thank her for me because- um, Well, I hope she's watching. <laughs> Way back many, many years. You know, uh, I think for her first um, American Folklore Society meeting, that's where she and I met. Really? <laughs> that was what, in the 80s? Yeah, she was a graduate student. I was a graduate student too. Oh, and you went to Penn, right? Yes, you know, I went to Penn, and I have to tell you that um, it was a very difficult choice. I mean, I'm situated because I have to tell Americo Perez that I was not going to stay at the at the University of Texas, you know. 
to study folklore with him and the rest. And that uh, my interests were in food and that at that moment uh, in time, uh, University of Pennsylvania had several scholars uh, also uh, re doing research on food. They had Barbara Kirschenbach Gimblet and they had Don Yoder and Arjuna Fadurai in anthropology and everything. And so he told me that that was a great, that's a good idea because he didn't deal with material culture. He said, and that's the place to go if you want to study. <laughs> well, I remember when I met you and you were working on barbacoa. And I remember telling my mother that you were working on your dissertation on barbacoa. And she couldn't believe it. <laughs> well, the award means a lot to me because, you know, coming from the medical paredes, it's, a, I believe, a very important award and prestigious award, but also what it embodies. And all the people that have received that award. So in my case, you know, I do feel honored that I'm in that company. The other thing is you also know that there are a lot of people that are deserving of this award also. Yeah. And, and hopefully they will get it too. But uh, being from uh, South Texas and, and America Paredes being from South Texas and getting that award, it seems like um, it was all worth it, you know, doing it. And But along the way, I have to also... Uh, acknowledge that uh, so many friends, you know, like Olivia gave me a great opportunity, uh, Tim Lloyd when he was in Washington, D.C., you know, with the American Folk Life. So they, they always would hire me to do work and train me as a field worker. And, and then later on, we became colleagues, you know, that I, I worked a lot with them. So Olivia and, and Tim, and then you have Susie Serb and you and Olga and uh, and, yeah, I, I think it's just a testament to your ability to to do good field work and to get along with people and talk. <laughs> yes, of course, because when you, when you do field work, you meet a lot of people. <laughs> That's true. And uh, I remember in Laredo, with, uh, you did some of that field work for your um, barbacoa research. And yeah, you, you would get along with all the guys. <laughs> I'm going to bring you one person that you will probably remember. Remember the toy maker? Oh, yes. Okay. The piñata maker, yeah. He was one that was uh, cantankerous with me, but very nice. But he had to first put me through hell, and then he would <laughs> give me everything, okay? But that was every day. Then I would go knock at his door. He would always complain to me why I was there. I think then he, I said, well, I'm going to leave. He said, no, no, don't leave, stay. <laughs> okay, that's good. But you know, you just have to be patient with him. But I always remember him that uh, he was very nice, you know, but I had to, every time I had to pass the test. Well, I am just so, so happy and, and thrilled that you received the Americo Paredes Award this year from AFS. Well, um, I feel the same way. And, um, and I'm very happy, you know, and, and hopefully one day we'll see each other in person. <laughs> True. Bueno, Mario, yeah, un, un abrazo. Un abrazo y cuídate mucho, Thank okay? Thank you. Congratulations, Mario. The Benjamin A. Botkin Prize is for lifetime achievement in public folklore. And it will be presented in a pre recorded video by Maggie Holtzberg of Massachusetts Cultural Council, a past Botkin recipient and member of the prize committee. Each year, the AFS Executive Board joins with AFS Public Programs section to award the Benjamin Botkin Prize for significant lifetime achievement in public folklore. This prize is given in recognition of Benjamin A. Botkin, eminent New Deal folklorist. Botkin has had a major impact on the field of public folklore and the public understanding of folklore. I wish to thank fellow members of the Botkin Prize Committee for their help in selecting this year's recipient, Kathleen Mundell, Amanda Dargan, Patricia Sawin, Langston Wilkins, and Cherish Bishop. From a field of very deserving nominations, it is my honor to announce that this year's Benjamin A. Botkin Prize goes to Dr. Marsha McDowell.
Through scholarly contributions and groundbreaking public programs, Marsha McDowell has been a respected leader and innovator in the field of public folklore for over 40 years. Since 1984, she has directed the Michigan Traditional Arts Program, successfully collaborating on research, documentation, collection development, exhibitions, and educational programs focusing on Michigan's traditional culture. Concurrently, McDowell holds positions as Curator of Folk Arts, Michigan State University Museum, and Professor, Department of Art and Art History. According to nominator Micah Ling, McDowell's work centers on studying the production, use, and meaning of traditional material culture, especially that of Hmong Americans, Native Americans, African Americans, South Africans, and women. Her inquiry is grounded in an interdisciplinary approach to material culture, informed by art historical, folkloristic, and ethnographic theories and methodologies. Her work ranges from the crucial examination of the role museums play in contemporary society, the development uh, of educational resources and public arts policies related to traditional arts, and of the development of strategies to make collected data accessible online. Several nominators cited McDowell's creativity in developing innovative public programming. Simon Bronner refers to her Folk Patterns Project a collaboration between Michigan State University Museum and Cooperative Extension 4-H groups as a stroke of genius. A founding director of the Festival of Michigan Folklife and later the Great Lakes Folk Festival, McDowell also served as artistic director until its end in 2017. She's also been deeply engaged in initiatives of regional, national, and international scope. Bronner describes McDowell's work as having a tremendous impact, not only on public appreciation of folklore work and folk traditions, but also on global folkloristic and heritage studies scholarship. A respective scholar in quilt research, McDowell is director of the Quilt Index, a digital repository of thousands of images, stories, and information about quilts and their makers drawn from hundreds of public and private collections around the world. Best Lomac Hawes NEA Heritage Fellow, Carolyn Maslumi, describes McDowell's impact. Dr. McDowell is a steward of African-American quilt history, whose history has been sparingly or completely ignored. She has guided Michigan State University Museum's <clears throat> collection of quilts most notably, a stellar collection of quilts addressing political and social issues. Through her curated exhibitions, Marsha McDowell has helped create a space that allows us to unfold difficult stories. In closing, I quote Black Ash Basket Maker and National Heritage Fellow Kelly Church speaking to McDowell's influence as mentor and advocate. Quote, her confidence in me early on as an artist gave me the confidence to now lead some of our next generations of Native leaders. She helped our voices to be heard and our traditional arts to be seen. She is all that this award embodies. Folk and traditional arts are not just part of her work or a job, but a part of who she is as a person. It is her life and passion. And now please join me in congratulating Dr. Marsha McDowell. Marsha, on behalf of the committee <laughs> selecting this prize, I am so delighted that this is going to you and to have you here in conversation with me. Um, you, your work is, is, of course, unknown to many of us in the society, um, but you've, and you've been through ups and downs um, and have come through with such <laughs> leadership and innovation. Oh, listen. You know, I know this award was announced at uh, the public sector, public programs um, section meeting, and I said it then, and I say it now, oh my! <laughs> <laughs> I just feel so deeply honored to receive this award from so many people who I feel are my peers, the, the people that I've learned from, and I admire so much, and I, and I went 
online to look at the past recipients, including you, who I'm, I just think they're just such a wonderful group of individuals, and I feel privileged to join that group. And I just say thank you. And I think that um, I join a group of people who collectively have gotten in a lot of good trouble. I do want to say a couple of words, and that is that I just have to acknowledge that my work has not been done al alone, and that my work has been uh, always done by seeking out partnerships with others, whether it's Kelly Church or um, Dr. Maslumi. I, I, I always like to seek out partnerships with professionals, um, my colleagues, but I also with community members and I cherish working together side by side, identifying needs and kind of creatively coming up with solutions and using my tools as a folklorist to address those. So um, there's so many people that I wanted to say thank you to, but then I realized it was a long list. But I would highlight a couple, for sure. Um, I, and I will say that there was the team of people that I've worked with at the Michigan Traditional Arts Program and the team of people I've worked with at the Quilt Index who've been particularly over the long haul have been just solid colleagues. And I so have enjoyed working with each and every one of them. But then I'm also blessed to have been able to work with family. And um, my long time uh, partner in crime has been uh, Dr. C. Kurt Dewhurst, my husband, and that's been wonderful. But I've also worked with other family members as well. And I, I just think it's amazing that I, in this field, I've been able to do that and go back and forth between the personal and the public and the scholarly and the community and um, still always be able to link things together and find ways, new ways forward. Well, you, you've negotiated all those different worlds sublimely and we mm -hmm. all thank you for it. Oh, it's just been terrific. I mean, I can't imagine any other field of work than having been affiliated with the American Folklore Society and Congratulations again, Marsha. Um, I will say that um, getting to help record some of these chats meant that I got to be the quiet person in some of these conversations, very much like um, the silent party on the party telephone line. And it was such a delight to hear colleagues speaking to each other in this way and um, very grateful to be here and to be able to present this to you this way today. Finally, uh, the last award that we'll present today is the 2020 AFS Lifetime Scholarly Achievement Award. This year, the award goes to Jeff Todd Titan for his long, distinguished, and groundbreaking career as a field worker, educator, author, editor, theorist, and mentor. The prize committee offers the following overview of Jeff's scholarly impact. With an MA in English and a PhD in American Studies, Dr. Titan's first permanent academic position was at Tufts University where, in addition to teaching American literature, folklore, and ethnomusicology, he established an MA program, program in ethnomusicology and co-founded a program in American Studies. In 1986, he moved to Brown University where he was professor of music and served as director of the PhD program in ethnomusicology until his retirement al almost three decades later in 2013. A, distinct, a distinguishing feature of Titan's career is that it bridges the sister disciplines of folklore studies and ethnomusicology. Indeed, in one of his early pathbreaking contributions, he was able to draw on understandings of public folklore learned from working with Ralph Rensler and Bess Hawes and incorporate them into applied ethnomusicology, the kind of natural cross fertilization between disciplines that is evident in so much of his work. As a member of both AFS and SEM since 1974, 
Titan has also used his energy and insight to serve his colleagues and the profession. He was editor of SEM's journal Ethnomusicology for five years, served as AFS executive board member, and has been an AFS fellow since 1998. Although Titan's scholarly accomplishments are too numerous to do justice to here, a quick overview provides a sense of his broad erudition and, and extraordinary energy. He has written or edited nine books and authored well over 60 articles and book chapters. He has been a visiting professor at six institutions, received fellowships from NEH and NEA in addition to many others, made three documentary films, and has produced seven records. His recordings have been selected for preservation in the National Recording Registry, and his field recordings and professional papers are currently being archived at the American Folklife Center. Even as we celebrate Dr. Titan's lifetime of achievements, it is also clear that he has more critical contributions to come. He maintains an active and provocative blog on music and sustainability, and in August of this year, his most recent book, Toward a Sound Ecology, was released by Indiana University Press. Finally, as if his own accomplishments had not already made an indelible mark on the study of folklore and ethnomusicology, Titan has also supervised and mentored dozens of graduate students who themselves now serve in influential positions in public folklore and at numerous academic institutions. Moreover, even in retirement, Titan's impact continues. In the nomination for this award, a scholar who has only recently worked with Titan explains that his experience, quote, confirmed for me what I had heard from many others in the fields of folklore, ethnomusicology, and Appalachian studies, that Dr. Titan is an extraordinary scholar and an extraordinary person. Congratulations, Jeff. And here is the video clip from Norma's call to Jeff announcing his win. I'm so happy <laughs> that Jeff is our um, Lifetime Scholarly Achievement Awardee. I am just thrilled after, what, over 45 years in the field working as a professor, as an author, as a researcher, as a colleague for many, many, um, and also a mentor for many, many students. So I really feel that this is well-deserved and I'm so pleased, Jeff, to formally announce the Lifetime Scholarly Achievement Award from the American Folklore Society. Well, thank you so much, Norma. I am thrilled and humbled by, uh, by this. And uh, I feel a little bit like the person in Deer Isle who uh, is in the nursing home who got the golden cane and was asked how uh, she felt about it. Uh, the golden cane is awarded to the oldest person in the town, you know. And so she said she felt she was going to keep it a long time. And I thought that maybe uh, this lifetime award would be something that I would want to keep for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's yours <laughs> for a long, long time. <laughs> well, and, uh... it's, 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 uh, it's lovely to have it. I uh, I'm glad you mentioned mentoring. I wanted to thank my own uh, mentors, scholarly mentors in the field. Uh, Albert Lord was very important to me and Sandy Ives as well. Dan Patterson, who's still with us at the age of 90, and Archie Green, and Bess Hawes also uh, very, very important to, to me in the generation that came just ahead of me, and I wanted to be sure to thank them. Yes, we should always acknowledge those who came before. And um, for me, Bess also was really amazing mentor when I was in, at the NEA. Uh, I also think we should, uh, because I got this award too, and I know the feeling of like, there are so many others who deserve it and, you know, why me? But on the other hand, and I think you will agree, you and I and others of our age, of a certain age, uh, represent the passing on of that torch from our mentors to us to our mentees. And I know many, many students that you've touched and who carry on because of you work in public sector folklore, but also in academia and doing work that matters 
out in the world. So thank you again so much for all the work you've done. I not I've started using thank you for your service. Yes. Your service to AFS, your service to our field, and of course uh, to the university, to the academy. Well, I, I appreciate that. I I've always loved learning and I was lucky enough to be able to make a life out of it. I think I discovered that in in high school, really. When someone asks me how I became interested in, in folklore, I say, I'm, I'm not really sure. I just was interested in people first, and uh, I, I became interested in music, and I, I think that connection is, is terribly important, and I was very lucky to be able to discover folklore and ethnomusicology as well in college and graduate school, and then to go ahead and be able to make a life out of it. So Yeah, I'm glad you're mentioning I wanted also to acknowledge the importance of public folklore uh, to, to, to me, to my life, and, and so forth. I started learning about public folklore from Bess Hawes in 1976 when she asked me to uh, be a presenter at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. I just didn't know what public folklore was at that point, and she was directing the festival. Ralph uh, Rinsler had asked her to direct the festival then. And so I worked as a presenter at the festival and began to understand the vision of, of cultural democracy that public folklore embodies. And, and that was very important to me. And although I, I continued in an academic position, I had a strong commitment to public folklore and to uh, public ethnomusicology as well. And uh, I remember uh, Bess and I and uh, Bob Garfius and a number of other ethnomusicologists at the ethno conferences would uh, tell ethnomusicologists, look, you know, we have this wonderful National Endowment for the Arts Spoken Traditional Arts Program. We have the Smithsonian Center. We have the American Folklife Center. Uh, please uh, uh, come and, and, and work with us. And then gradually many did. And in the 1990s, public ethnomusicology became a very strong force within the field of ethnomusicology. It, it sort of comes out of being a participant as well. I was a participant and uh, thought that field, field work was a little odd because I'd already been kind of doing it. <laughs> and so I, I, I thought that the best way to do it was to make friends with, with the people, you know, or to be friends. And, uh, you know, in those days, we were being taught to be investigative reporters or scientific flies on the wall, and that just didn't seem to make any sense to me at all. So I tried to develop that idea of friendship and, and field work. And on that note, <laughs> thank you, Jessica, again. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. And really thank you, Norman. And thank yeah, you, thank you both. And, and, uh, We'll, we'll see you at the meeting, Jeff. Um, we look forward to that and um, to the award presentation and to all the conversations that are going to happen via Zoom next week. Thank you. Oh, boy. <laughs> I only hope I can get into the meeting. <laughs> Watch <laughs> out. All right. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Norma. Um, thank this, thank was, you, Jeff. this was a delight. Thank Good you. to see you all. Wow, congratulations to all of the 2020 astounding winners um, for the AFS awards. Man, Chris, I mean, they was kicking it out. Was they not kicking it That's out? That's true. That's true. Yeah, we yeah. And look, I know it sounded really, really quiet, but if you look at the chat, you could hear the cheers and the clapping, and everybody was just, you know, it was just congratulations to everyone, <laughs> right, right? That uh, is the truth. Yeah, that, and yeah. It, yeah, in the chat, it also said that um, one of the things that I saw people saying is, dang, I wish we could see each other, I wish we could see each other, I wish we could talk to one another, right? And so we're going to do something about that, right? That's right. That's right. So what do we want to do about that? You know, this is, you know, these annual meetings, there's formal proceedings, but we're going to get together in reception breakout rooms for people to join if they want. And uh, we're going to be in one together. Right. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. I think, 
I think we'll be in a room with some of the newcomers, welcoming yes. them. And I, we just want to encourage you all to, to come in those breakout rooms. Don't, don't open another tab on your browser. You know, take, get your dinner, come back to the uh, computer in a little while and just uh, be together. Let's continue this. Let's talk about Jeff Todd Titan's award. Let's talk about the incredible work and speeches of Dr. Norma Cantu and the incredible job that Jessica and uh, Jessica Turner and uh, Meredith McGriff and Lorraine Cashman and one man, uh, Thomas R Grant Richardson has done mm -hmm. in putting this all together. So um, we have got to, I wish we could uh, applaud Thomas as much as possible because he's not on the screen right now. Yeah, do it, do it. He's not, yeah. he's, he's, but he's here. <laughs> he's been with us the whole time. So um, we're going to uh, bring Thomas on. Is that is that the truth uh, to bring him out to talk about some of these breakout rooms, give us some idea about what they're all about? All right. We want to do that before we sign out. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, mm -hmm. Queen. Uh, this was amazing. We pulled it off. <laughs> Good start to the week. That's right. Um, Definitely, I mean, everyone's feeling that same thing, right? We want to be together. We wish we could be together. Um, I have legitimate folklore <laughs> family, but a lot of us talk about the greater folklore family. Uh, what I'm missing right now is that thing that happens when you get to AFS and you get to the hotel and you see those people and you just grab them and say, hey, come over here, let's get a drink, let's go find the nearest cafe, the nearest bar. I, I, I can't wait to see you. We've uh, done some things to try to create a virtual space like that. So like you guys have said, there's some reception breakouts, not right away. You're going to take a little break, you know, and then come back. Same hub. It's also a chance to play around with this and see how simple this is all going to run for the week. Um, but yeah, we've got uh, Norma and the executive board hosting a room. Uh, Jessica Turner and you guys are going to host a room. Um, if you're a student right now, we've got Micah Ling from IU and Ellie Dassler from Western Kentucky, who are going to talk about student issues. Um, we've got Naomi from the Public Folklore Project, joined with uh, Lamont Purley, if you're kind of a public sector uh, worker. We've got Mincy Martinez Rivera and the Cultural Diversity Committee here to offer a warm reception to all BIPOC attendees. Uh, we've got Luisa Dudice uh, for international participants. Um, if you want to get a little more serious, you want to hit the ground running, I'm here to work. I would suggest checking out Emily Sokolov and Gabriel Greaves uh, breakout session. Um, and we've got Caitlin Kinney uh, talking about new directions and digital folklore, if that's your jam. Uh, and Meredith McGriff is hosting a room for LGBTQIA attendees. Um, we might pop around a little bit, but I don't think so. Because when I show up at AFS, I know who I'm after. I get to see a lot of my friends and colleagues throughout the year, but not everyone. Some people I only get to see once a year at AFS. So for me, I'm calling Molly Garfinkel at City Lore as <laughs> soon as we're done. And I'm going to be like, Molly, get on a Zoom. Because right now, I would be running across the lobby waiting to give you a bit, big bear hug. Molly doesn't answer, calling Guha Shanker and saying, Guha, let's chat for a while. That's what I'm missing so much. Um, and I know you are. And the great thing is we can fix it. Because we have these things called phones. We've got these Zooms. We can reach out. We can, we're getting used to this now. And so I encourage everyone to make those real connections. You know, reach out to your people. Don't email them. Call them. Text them. Zoom them. See them face to face. Because uh, just seeing all of these faces so far has given me an energy like I haven't in uh, the last several weeks. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Queen, Chris. Thank you, Norma. Thank you, Jessica. Take us home. Thank you. Amen. Thank you Amen. so much for a great job that you're doing. And everyone, we hope to see you in those breakout rooms. We want to continue this feeling because we're going to play that I'm so glad I'm here again. Y'all going to put that up because we're <laughs> so glad you are here. And we just really want to thank you. We look, we look forward to the bonding in the breakout rooms. So glad you're here, y'all. So glad you're here.
We appreciate all your giving your time and energy and being here and staying with us. Continue to stay with us and let's all continue to be together. I agree with Thomas. This has uh, really made me feel really good to see everyone and, and see all the encouragement happening. Let's continue it all week. So thanks so much to Queen. Also, what an honor to be doing this with you. Chris. Fantastic. I'm such a, so honored to be your colleague. So what um, up, what up? <laughs> right, right. All right. On behalf of the executive director and the president and the whole 132nd annual meeting team from the American Folklore Society, we want to say thank you. We look forward to seeing you some more and good night. I can't play this